there are options, and that's why we need to take this opportunity seriously. There's no way you can prevent global warming unless China is part of the solution. This is not normal male behavior. This is predatory behavior. We don't know how bad this bug is. We don't know what this bug does. All of that was thrown away in those eight minutes and 46 seconds, and that's the moment that I became an abolitionist. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Welcome to the Monk Debates. Every episode, we provide you with a civil and substantive debate on the big issue of the day to arm you, the listener, with enough information to make up your own mind. Today's debate, be it resolved, the statues must come down. After 131 years, the largest Confederate statue in the United States of Confederate General Robert E. Lee came down today in Richmond. The statue of British wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill defaced with red paint in downtown Edmonton. Breaking overnight, a statue of Christopher Columbus has been beheaded in Boston. Look at these. The city of Victoria plans to take down a statue of Canada's first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, from the front steps of City Hall. Hello, I'm your moderator, Rudyard Griffiths. Well, it's become one of the most divisive topics in today's culture wars. What to do with statues of historical figures and their controversial past. The people calling for statues to come down and streets to be renamed argue that those who promote racist and imperialist policies in their own time should not be given the privilege of public glorification in ours. So for those self-appointed defenders of history and the monuments, they are eerily silent on what amounts to historical malfeasance, a lie by omission. There is a difference, you see, between remembrance of history and the reverence of it. That was New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landrieu explaining the city's decision to remove four Confederate monuments. Others argue that so-called social justice mobs are ignoring the context in which these past transgressions took place, rewriting history to serve their ideological purposes today. Here's Canadian Conservative Party leader, Aaron O'Toole. There is not a place on this planet whose history can withstand close scrutiny, but there is a difference between acknowledging where we've fallen short There is a difference between legitimate criticism and always tearing down the country. Critics of these activist groups believe that if progressives succeed in their purity purge, we will be left with no heroes, no history, and no nuanced understanding of our common past. On this installment of the Monk Debates, we challenge the essence of these arguments by debating the motion, be it resolved, the statues must come down. Arguing for the motion is Cornell William Brooks. He's a professor of the practice of public leadership and social justice at the Harvard Kennedy School and is former president of the NAACP. Arguing against the motion is George F. Will, the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Washington Post and bestselling author. His latest book is American Happiness and Discontents, The Unruly Torrent. Cornell, George, welcome to the Monk Debates. Good to be with you. Glad to be with you. Very much looking forward to our conversation and debate today. This has been uh, one of the animating topics of uh, political, social, and cultural debates over the last year or more. And to have the two of you who've thought long and hard about uh, this key debate uh, reflected on that in your own writings and discussions, but to bring the two of you together for a, a thoughtful, civil, and substantive debate on what is a difficult issue is a privilege indeed. And I just want to thank you both on behalf of the Monk Debates community and all of our listeners for your willingness to engage each other in this debate. Our resolution today, simple to the point be it resolved, the statues must come down. Cornell, you're arguing in favor of the motion. I'm going to put a couple of minutes on the clock and hand the program over to you. As a civil rights lawyer and later fourth generation ordained minister, I've made my home in Northern Virginia for many years, not too distant 
from Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, uh, a place in which monuments to Confederate generals, Robert E. Lee, have stood for so many years as a testament to the nation's past and our inability, at least in this country, the United States, to remember it and to reconcile ourselves with it. Not too distant from Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, the home of the Unite the Right rally, but also the home of Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia and Monticello, and also the home for many years of a monument to a Confederate general who presided and provided military moral support for a slaveocracy in which four million African Americans were enslaved. In the midst of this global anti-colonialist racial reckoning, all across the length and breadth of Canada, the United States, and around the world, we have a generation of advocates and activists calling for these statues to come down. Why? Because these statues represent not the lessons of the past, but our inability or unwillingness to come to grips with the lessons of the past because we have endeavored in so many instances to romanticize the past, to forget the past, to fail to remember the past. So when we think of the words of George Santayana back in 1905, whose words yet ring true, that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who cannot remember, those who choose to remove the stories the histories, the narratives of resistance and resilience are condemned to repeat the past and they yet condemn the rest of us to repeat the past. So these statues that speak to our colonial history or fail to speak to our colonial history, that romanticize and glorify and commemorate our racist histories have to come down, not only so that we might come to grips with the past, but that we might find inspiration and the proper historical grounding to face the present and to embrace the future. They have to come down. Thank you, Cornell. Precise, powerful opening statement. Our resolution today, be it resolved, the statues must come down. George Will, you're arguing against the motion. Let's have your opening remarks. Well, this is a, is a summons to moral reasoning and the fundamental moral obligation we all have uh, as human beings is to be as intelligent as possible. And being intelligent involves making reasonable, intelligent distinctions. This is, of course, very important when we come to the matter of what national memory we should cultivate by honoring or not honoring particular people. The phrasing of the resolution says these statues must come down, a definite article, and surely we don't think all statues should come down. And we have to begin by saying when we commemorate human beings of any sort, we're commemorating flawed people. That's definitional to the part of being a human being. So deciding who to commemorate and shaping the national memory, it's an exercise of saying on balance, on balance, this person uh, mattered a lot and mattered on balance for the good and therefore his the good that he did or she did should be commemorated. In looking at statues, we have to bear in mind the motives matter, the motives, that is, for erecting the statues. If a statue was put up just as Jim Crow was being put in place, uh, that's a reason to think that it ought to be taken out the way uh, Jim Crow itself has been taken out. But it is one thing to say at the statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, the founder of the Ku Klux Klan and a war criminal, if we'd had that concept in the 1860s. Uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest is different from Thomas Woodrow Wilson, who had a dark racial side, but Forrest and Wilson are, have to be distinguished. Similarly, John Calhoun and John Marshall both slaveholders, but very different in their importance and in their, their moral stature. And once you start with the, the business of purging the past, you have to come to terms with, for example, what do you do about Franklin Roosevelt, who signed the order that stripped uh, rights from about 130,000 Japanese Americans, two-thirds of them citizens, more than half of them women and children, in the exclusion of the Japanese during the Second World War. So if we begin by understanding that even heroes can have feet of clay, 
We have to come finally to the proposition that I think we can discuss and defend, that if you can't have heroes, you can't have villains. That is, if you can't make these distinctions, uh, it's going to be hard to uh, decide who is on the continuum of goodness, uh, who is a hero and who is a villain. So with that in mind, let us proceed. (laughs) Thank you, George. Great opening statements from you both now, an opportunity for rebuttals. This is a chance for both of you to kind of weigh in on what you've heard from each other as we've opened up this debate. So, Cornell, to come to you first, uh, let's have your rebuttal, George Will. Well, first of all, let me, let me just begin by saying I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Will's distinction in terms of uh, gradations of, of good and evil and uh, imperfection among our heroes and heroines. But I think it's important to note here, as he has suggested, the purpose, the motive, uh, the intent behind these statues. So in other words, where many of the Confederate statues were erected uh, in the first 20 years of uh, the last century uh, and uh, during the civil rights movement, not and that is a way of educating the public with respect to uh, America's past. And this is true elsewhere, uh, but really as a way of glorifying romanticizing, commemorating brutality uh, in ways that made it acceptable, not only acceptable, uh, but in ways that would be acceptable, uh, palatable, and that would garner support for uh, Jim Crow. So we agree there, but I think it's also important for us to not uh, subscribe to this notion that uh, if we don't have heroes, we can't have villains. Uh, or that uh, our heroes have to, in fact, be perfect. The point being here is this is not a matter of some timeless standard of perfection roughly applied to the past. This is a matter of statues which literally commemorate people who've raped, pillaged, engaged in genocidal assault, and engaged in racial terrorism uh, to the detriment of uh, this country, but the U.S., but also... Canada in terms of colonial statues uh, and elsewhere. So we got to be clear in terms of the kind of statue and we have to be clear about the fact that we're not insisting on perfection among our heroes. We are, in fact, speaking very clearly to the fact that where you have commemoration as opposed to education, it leads to misinformation and it literally debilitates our ability to grapple with the past in order to come to grips with the present and literally embrace the future. Thank you, Cornell. Uh, George, your opportunity now, similarly, to uh, uh, rebut Cornell's opening statement or what you've just heard uh, in his rebuttal. Well, I think Cornell is quite right to say that uh, we have to be scrupulously diligent about avoiding romanticism, particularly the romanticism that came to be a, to envelop the South. When, in the second half of the 19th century, Reconstruction was liquidated, and the nation decided to sacrifice uh, the interests of African Americans and free men, free people, to national reconciliation. There was uh, a sentimentality about the lost cause. This uh, extended all the way into the 1930s when you had Gone with the Wind, both Margaret Mitchell's novel and the uh, movie, of course, but also Douglas Southall Freeman's multi-volume biography that was a huge bestseller in the 1930s, his biography of Robert E. Lee. So I think Cornell is quite right about that. One thing I would, would stress is it, it is one thing to talk about the statues relating to the Civil War and the great racial drama of this country. It is important to understand that once you start this business, uh, it's hard to stop. Because we've now seen, of course, people splashing paint on statues of uh, of uh, Winston Churchill, in in because he was uh, unsound at, by current sensibilities on the subject of India and colonization. We you need to have limiting principles, it seems to me, that will prevent a kind of indiscriminate attack on eminence and on greatness itself. Uh, There is in any democracy, as de Tocqueville warned us, a leveling impulse. And there is, I think, a tendency on the part of some people to say the statues themselves, by suggesting that some people are more important than others, are undemocratic. So this 
impulse to tidy up the national memory may start with the Civil War and the question of race and our sectional differences. But what starts there need not stay there. I'm simply warning that unless we think clearly, we're going to find that the the impulse for what has been now called the cancel culture is, ten, is going to leak into a broader examination and an, an indiscriminate attempt to purge society of all people who fail to meet very exacting contemporary sensibilities. Thank you, George, for that rebuttal. Uh, my opportunity now to join the debate and kind of think up some questions that are top of mind from our listeners uh, tuning into this really wonderful civil and substantive conversation. So, Cornell, let me come to you first with this idea of interpretation, that there's been an argument that is the removal of the statute necessary? Isn't there a, a bigger public good, a better public purpose served by leaving a statue there and reinterpreting it in our own more moment with additional education that could occur around that physical edifice to make people conscious of the very history that you've so eloquently talked about. Why isn't that a more a pragmatic and useful approach than the removal of these statues and the concern that George raises of this erasure of history, the disappearance, in a sense, of the past by its physical obliteration uh, in the form of the destruction of these statues? Mm, mm. Well, let me know a couple of things. When we talk about the removal of these statues as erasure, that assertion suggests that the erasure is commencing, is beginning, as opposed to our response to a previous erasure. So that is to say, these statues that are testaments to our racist past and present, colonialist past and present, erase stories of resilience, erase stories of liberation, erase stories of struggle, erase stories of the active efforts of people to free themselves, free others, uh, realize and recapture the promise of the countries in which they lived. And so stories have already been erased. The removal of these statues in many instances provide opportunities for us to tell stories, for us to embrace history, for us to literally uh, lift up the past in ways that give sight, uh, as in literally seeing the victims, the heroes and heroines of history who've been left out, but literally amplify the voices which have often been muted and rendered silent. So that's the first point in terms of uh, erasure and, and muting of history. The second part is this notion that if with these statues, we can somehow append a plaque, a footnote of history to make the commemoration of what didn't happen and that was lied about appropriate and educational in the present. So in other words, a... Uh, plaque, if you will, a, a, a plaque of education on a statue of commemoration leads to misinformation. It leads to romanticization. So in other words, we can't fix this by simply uh, footnoting uh, what, what uh, were often literally misstatements of history wrapped in marble. Thank you, Cornell. Uh, important point. So George, let me come to you with those two. Uh, this idea that about erasure and how it's really just uh, a previous erasure here that's being addressed. Uh, this isn't the one and true history of all time that is being removed with the removal of these histories. The removal of these statues, in fact, opens up the opportunity to recover those older histories uh, and the realities of them that were erased by the very erection of these statues. And then Cornell's second point here that Footnoting is not enough, uh, that this is, uh, this is a kind of a tokenism to the harm, the violence of these statues in our present and what they mean to African-Americans and other marginalized communities walking by them every day. These cause real hurt right now in America 2021. Yes, but again, to get back to the business of, of drawing distinctions, first, within the context of the Civil War and the racial reckoning in this country, there is surely a distinction to be drawn between 
Nathan Bedford Forrest, as I say, war criminal and first leader of the Ku Klux Klan, and Robert E. Lee, who was interesting because he was tormented and torn because he was situated in a way that it's very difficult for us to understand or sympathize with today. When he was invited by Lincoln to take charge of the uh, an important Union army, he said, I cannot draw my sword against my country. His country at that time was how he thought and was not alone in thinking this was Virginia. So it seems to me one of the tasks of education should be to tell people, to help people learn how to empathize with people who were situated in times and societies and cultures very different than the one we now have. This requires a kind of empathy that that you sometimes get from literature, but you also ought to get from biography and from history. And the question is, can any person on the losing side of the Civil War uh, deserve a place in public? That's a, that's a fair question. But again, I want to stress that once you start on this, it's very hard to stop. For example, and I'd be interested in Cornell's view on this, Jefferson was a slaveholder. He was also much else. James Madison was, in my judgment, uh, the most subtle political philosopher we have produced uh, in the United States in our 200 and some years. He was a slaveholder. John Marshall who, with his decisions, helped create the sinews of national strength that were turned on the South and destroyed the slaveocracy, was a slaveholder. Uh, so th- these are complicated judgments about them. W- w- Cornell, would you, are, are you comfortable? I was just at Marshall University in uh, Huntington, West Virginia, where they have a statue of uh, John Marshall, which has occasionally been controversial, but not very. Are you comfortable with a statue to John Marshall? In terms of recognizing on balance the good, evil, uh, mixed motives of various historical figures, Jefferson, Marshall, it's important here to, I think, lean on, as you've lifted up, biography, story, history in terms of pages and pixels, which give us an opportunity to present more complete fulsome pictures, as opposed to commemorative statues. So, for example, I I love the example you use with with respect to uh, Franklin Roosevelt, right? So Roosevelt, of of course, um, signs the executive order interning Japanese Americans, uh, but he was also, uh, in many ways, uh, a hero to a great many um, African Americans, uh, and so many Americans for so many reasons. The point being here is where you have these commemorative statues that leave out nuance, that literally glorify uh, oppression, my belief is that we need to shy away from the statues, tell more stories, write more biographies, teach more history. We should reserve commemorative statues for those whose deeds and lives uh, inspire, encourage, speak to the ideals of, of the country and our societies. And so that should be the principle here. In other words, we need more storytelling, more biography, more history, more nuance in order to provide avenues of empathy and understanding uh, in terms of complexity as opposed to these commemorative statutes. And, and, and let, me, let, me, let me note this. We've, we've not spent a lot of time talking about the impact of these statutes on young people, including children. Right. So in other words, it's it, it, when someone when a child walks past a statue commemorating literally someone who enslaved, tortured, terrorized their forebears. That's a psychological assault. There's no nuance there. There's no complexity there, as opposed to reading a book, studying a life. That would be my response. George, come back on that. That's a an interesting place to take this argument that it's not about the erasure of the past writ large. There's lots of opportunities in Cornell's argument here to investigate and interrogate the past. It's that these statues are a specific, you know, medium, modality of communication. They are heroic. They are, by their nature, a a bold, assertive, positive representation of an individual. They're not nuanced. 
They're not showing you multiple sides of an argument. They're crude, unsophisticated, and by virtue of their inability to communicate history in a richer, more contextualized way, that's a reason why, as per our resolution, the statues must come down. Well, then, again, let me help us reason by taking another concrete example. I'm a uh, I got my PhD at Princeton University. I served as a trustee there, and Woodrow Wilson is all over the place at Princeton University. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Woodrow Wilson, as president, gratuitously resegregated the federal workforce. He showed the first movie ever shown in the White House, and the, the one he showed was Birth of a Nation, which was the celebration. I keep coming back to poor Nathan Bedford Forrest and uh, the Ku Klux Klan. That group. Uh, What do we do with Woodrow Wilson? Now, Princeton has made some adjustments about uh, the prominence of Woodrow Wilson's name there, but the question is complex because Woodrow Wilson had had a a multifaceted career, leaving an enormous impress upon American society that goes beyond his unquestionably retrograde and aggressively retrograde views on race. As a conservative, I I offered jokingly to come to Princeton and teach people how to more comprehensively dislike Woodrow Wilson than just for his (laughs) racial views. But this strikes me as as a good example of to tell the story, as Cornell rightly stresses, to tell the story of Woodrow Wilson in a rounded way. The fact that uh, I didn't like much of his uh, legislative agenda is irrelevant. The, he, he, a lot of people liked it, and in any case, he was a shaper of modern America, the Federal Reserve System and all the rest. So it seems to me a, a, a mistake to sort of scrub Woodrow Wilson from the public square. Now, to again stay with Cornell's example, there will be young African Americans who will learn that Woodrow Wilson was in many ways, germane to them, exceedingly unpleasant person. But uh, I don't think that's a sufficient reason for, uh, as I say, scrubbing him from the public square and from the national memory, because he is a maker of modern America, for better or for worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, so, George, let, let's note this. There's a difference and a, a distinction to be made from scrubbing Woodrow Wilson from the public square as opposed to scrubbing him from public memory. The public square, as in the pedestal, as in the statue, uh, as in the uh, a name on a school, Wood, the, the Woodrow, former Woodrow Wilson school, as opposed to studying his long career in the academy, in public affairs. But his life and him as an example illustrates my point, meaning more books, fewer naming of buildings, and fewer statues. Why? Woodrow Wilson, as you well know, uh, is linked to Nathan Bedford Forrest in the sense that when he screened The Birth of a Nation in the White House, first film screening, a film which glorified the Klan, that was literally a a propagandist tool that inspired the, imagi- the racial imagination uh, of many in this country in terms of violence. And so the, the point being here is it's not merely that, you know, uh, President Wilson uh, screened this film at the White House. I mean, he's literally connected to the uh, founder of the Klan, point one. Point two, it's not merely that he segregated the federal workforce. Uh, he campaigned uh, in many ways, for the support at least of some black leaders, and then got to the White House, gratuitously segregated the federal workforce. William Monroe Trotter, for whom the Trotter Collaborative for Social Justice at Harvard is named, uh, a pioneering civil rights leader, was kicked out of the White House by Woodrow Wilson because uh, he resisted. He opposed the segregation of the federal workforce. The point being here is Wilson is a complex figure. He's a complex figure uh, who was racist, who did things that were absolutely terrible uh, at Princeton, in the White House, uh, in other places. He needs to be studied, not commemorated. Again, more books, more biographies, fewer statues, and, and fewer names on buildings. Hi, Rudyard Griffiths here, your host and moderator. I have a favor to ask you. 
please consider becoming a Monk member. Membership is free and you get access to a series of great benefits, including a 10 plus year library of some of our best debates, dialogues, and podcasts. You also get a free monthly newsletter featuring the debates that we're watching around the world. And you get a specially curated Friday weekly Monk Members Only podcast that focuses on the big international events and trends shaping our world. All of that, again, free at www.monkdebates.com. I hope you'll consider joining and becoming part of our community. Now, back to our program. George, is there is there a compromise here that, you know, what Cornell's saying here is it's about a reset. It's about a different series of emphases that, you know, we're going to create as a society around commemoration and that we're going to look at commemoration in a different way. We're, it's not about hagiography, and that's not why we have statues. And if the statues are about hagiography, then they come down because we just have a more sophisticated view of the past now than we did in the past. The question is, how binary is the choice that Cornell is suggesting? That is, do we say we're either going to study and tell stories about, or we're going to have statues? Because again, I want to. what are you going to do about uh, uh, the Jefferson Memorial? I live in Washington and uh, drive by the Jefferson Memorial constantly. Jefferson was... Uh, as uh, to use the word that Cornell used about what it was, complex and uh, tormented by America's racial dilemma, but he, until he died, was a slave owner. It seems to me that uh, it ought to be possible to tell stories, stories that include large blemishes, but uh, stories that lead us to conclude that on balance, this is uh, an admirable and uh, an important figure who ought to be commemorated. So, Cornell, I mean, what do you do? I mean, je- that's a great example. The Jefferson Memorial is such an iconic piece of statuary uh, in your nation's capital, given this incredible prominence uh, on the mall. How do you approach that in, in your view? Can you square the circle where you allow that statue to continue. It is hagiography. It is a validation of of Jefferson and his life. Um, Is that okay in your view of a more nuanced, sophisticated approach to the past? I will note this, that, of course, Thomas Jefferson being a slave owner, um, being a man who, with respect to Sally Hemings, because as a slave, she, as an enslaved woman, she could not uh, give consent. Um, I would argue that uh, he was a, a rapist, a sexual assaulter. Yes, he was a complex figure. That's a tough example, given that his words, Jefferson's words, have been invoked by any number of aspirants uh, in terms of freedom and emancipation um, from, for decades on end. He's a complex figure. But let me note this. The fact that you have a notable example does not obliterate the necessity for a rule and a conversation. And so, yes, uh, the Jefferson Memorial uh, certainly has inspired a great many uh, people. Um, n- not too many years after the March on Washington, I recall my parents taking me as a little boy to the Jefferson Memorial. So I think I understand and appreciate uh, George's point. But there's a bigger point here, which is to say the rare and notable potential exceptions to the rule don't uh, obliterate the necessity for more rules. And again, more stories, more biographies, more study, more history, less uh, hagiography and blind commemorization and romanticization. Because the fact of the matter is, when we look at the hundreds of statues uh, across this country and elsewhere, The fact of the matter is we literally have generations of children who are walking past these statues and wondering, what does the presence of the statue say to me in my history? And what does the absence 
of stories about my history and a, a larger, more inclusive history, say about the countries in which we live. That's true with respect to indigenous uh, children. Uh, it's true with respect to black children, Latino children, but also white children whose histories are wrapped up in the stories of indigenous children and black children and Latino children. The, the point being here is, yes, George, that I, I agree that that is a uh, potential exception to the rule. But again, we spent a lot of time talking about the exception uh, and not as much time talking about the rule and the necessity for the rule. When the young Cornell was taken to the Jefferson Memorial, I hope and assume that his gaze was turned up to the words of Jefferson, some of the words of Jefferson that are carved in large letters in the marble there. They include the following. I tremble for my country when I think that God is just. Now, when that is explained to people at the, at the Jefferson Memorial, they understand that he trembled for his country because a just God will punish the country for, its, for slavery. That's what he was talking about. That's right. That's right. So that's an example of how you, uh, and it's not quite warts and all, but sort of warts and all. That was the, the fam- when Oliver Cromwell was ha- being, having his portrait painted, he famously told the painter, paint me warts and all. Uh, that's a sort of warts and all memorial to Jefferson because it, it acknowledges his acknowledgement of a, a great national failing. I think, uh, Cornell, I don't know what you think about this, but I, I have a home in South Carolina mm-hmm. where Calhoun is everywhere. Yes. Cal- yes. Calhoun was, was brilliant, ambitious, skillful, and thoroughly bad. But I should think that... Uh, African-American young people walking by it and would say, ha, we won, you lost, and uh, take great satisfaction from the fact that uh, he's, he's, a, he's a relic of a truly lost cause. And I, I, uh, I, really I, don't, I, and I appreciate that example, yes. I, I, I really don't think that the people in South Carolina today uh, look at that statue and says, good old John Calhoun, uh, someone we want to emulate. They know better. Uh, but they say this is really an important part of our past, and there it is. And I think some of the reflection prompted by a statute like that is really quite healthy, saying he lost because today in the South, uh, the only established religion in the United States is SEC football. And you go to an SEC football game, say Mississippi against Alabama, and the head referee is apt to be an African-American bossing everyone around, making rules and you look out on that field and you say, my goodness, things have changed a lot for the better. Well, now George, I, I love this example, but perhaps not for the reasons that you might think. So I, I'm a South Carolinian and grew up around testaments to Sir Johnson, uh, John C. Calhoun's uh, brutal legacy. But as a law student at Yale Law School, I had to walk past Calhoun College. And it represented to me a legacy of slavery on the campus of Yale University. Decades later, a generation later, a generation of students call for the renaming of Calhoun College at Yale and for the naming of a new college at at Yale, namely after Pauli Murray, the intellectual architect of the Brown v. Board of Education decision, ending, legally speaking, our separate uh, but equal. Uh, Paulie Murray, who graduated top of her class at, at Howard, got the first JSD from Yale Law School and who inspired Ruth Bader Ginsburg to fight sex discrimination. Here's the point. The presence of John C. Calhoun College in many ways muted the voices, muted the stories, obliterated the visions of Heron's uh, and heroes in our past. And when his name came down, I, it's not a coincidence that Pauli Murray's name went up. So these statues are not just about presence, they're about absence, not just about statements, they're about the muting of voices. And so the harm of these statues is, is not merely a matter of, you know, romanticizing the past and, and putting an ahistorical revisionist lens on the past. Uh, It's also about, again, muting voices. And the last point I want to make here is when you walk past these statues, children don't say our forebears won 
and therefore bears loss, they say they're still winning because their statutes commemorating their past, their lost cause are standing and our statutes have yet to be erected. Except there is, of course, there is a, a statue in Richmond to Arthur Ashe. So statues have come up. There is a statue not far from the Jefferson Memorial uh, to Martin Luther King. Uh, so the statues co- are coming up, and uh, there is a slow, perhaps still inadequate, redress uh, underway. But it, it, it does reflect the change sensibility. I'd like to... Uh just to touch on one bigger picture question before we go to closing statement, it's, it's really to hear you both because you've been so uh, thoughtful in this debate about what what do we owe the past and what does the past owe us? And maybe to come to you first, George, with this argument that, you know, the past is the past. Uh, these people are no longer alive. Whether we take their statue down or not, it does no harm to them. The present is where we live. Uh, how we understand the present, how we interpret the present. This is what matters. So let's get on with it. And and why be hung up with a with a past that is past, that is over? It can never be recovered. Well, except as, as a Mississippian, William Faulkner said in his Nobel Prize for Literature acceptance speech, the past is never past. It, it's in us. It's in our vocabulary. It's in our architecture. It's in our statues. It's everywhere. Uh, what we owe the past is honesty, uh, honesty about uh, its flaws and honesty about the dilemmas people faced being situated as they were. What irritates me about some of the, the attacks, the promiscuous attacks on U.S. Grant and Winston Churchill and Teddy Roosevelt, oh my goodness, on and on, is that there's, there's an, at work here an exercise in vanity on the part of contemporaries. Someone say, well, I may be only a an adjunct lecturer on gender studies at a community college, but I'm a better person than Winston Churchill. I got news for you. You're not. And, and this idea that uh, uh, some of this statue uh, toppling is an exercise in vanity on the part of the topplers, rather than what we should be seeking, which is an exercise in empathy for people uh, who grappled with moral ambiguities that we did not face, and we cannot be sure that they grappled worse than we would have done. Mm-hmm. Similar big question for you before we go to closing statements, Cornell. I mean, there is an argument that we are imbued in a culture of narcissism, and by trying to so consciously and explicitly refashion the past around the values of our present, um, it may make us feel better, it may be validating and in terms of uh, a world that reflects our views, our assumptions. But isn't it at the end of the day just all so ephemeral? It's so temporary. The next generation will come along and reinterpret our present as their past, you know, by asserting their present over our past. Isn't this all just in some ways pointless? Mm. Well, I have to say here, um, I don't don't believe it's uh, pointless and I'm quite optimistic about our ability to come to grips with the past in order to address the challenges of the present. But to go to your earlier point about what do we owe the past and what do we owe the present, we owe the past, and here I agree with George, we owe the past uh, a commitment to honesty, a commitment to truth telling, a commitment to intellectual uh, and moral integrity which means we have to face it with our eyes open and our hearts open and our minds open, point one. Point two, I just want to note here, this is not a matter of applying retrospectively the values of the present to the past in ways that are unfair. When we look at the heroes and heroines of of yesterday who have been unduly commemorated, uh, there's this notion somehow we're being unfair. We're applying uh, 2021 values to uh, 1850 figures. Well, let us note this. When we think about uh, people like Harriet Tubman, we think about people like W.E.B. Du Bois, when we think about Carter G. Woods, when we we think about uh, Frederick Douglass uh, making uh, demands for justice and equality and emancipation and liberation, those values sound like the values of many of the people uh, in the streets in 2021. So in other words, this commitment 
to human agency, this commitment to uh, freedom. Uh, these aren't complete, these aren't modern day notions. And, and, and George, I think you will agree with me. I mean, to the extent that Jefferson talked about the innate value of people, right, uh, and being a predicate to rights, the Imago Dei embedded in the Declaration of Independence. That sounds a lot like Black Lives Matter. We have innate value and worth. The point being here is that this is not a matter of like modern day vanity. This is a matter of like modern day commitment to history. So in other words, when I hear 19 year olds talking about reconstruction, talking about the civil rights movement, talking about uh, the founding hypocrisy and contradictions uh, in our respective histories, what I hear there is a commitment to honesty, a commitment to truth telling, a commitment to history. Thank you, Cornell. Let's move to closing statements in this excellent debate we've been having. Our resolution today, be it resolved, the statues must come down. George Will, you've been arguing against the motion. Let's have your final points in this debate. What I'm really arguing against is a kind of moral puritanism that, that is self-absorbed and self-regarding that says, I want to make a statement about me, and I'll make a statement about me by my stance towards statues. I'm reminded of Horace Greeley as the Civil War approach, saying, let the Aryan sisters, meaning the seceding states, let the Aryan sisters go in peace so that he, moral Greeley, wouldn't be tainted by association with uh, the South. Those uh, those abolitionists who said, we, we will leave the slaves in slavery and accept secession so that we won't be tainted by this this moral dilemma of what to do about the South. George Orwell in 1984 famously wrote that he who controls the past controls the future and he who controls the present controls the past. I guess my worry is about the question of control. I don't want to control the past. Uh, I, I want the past to be faced as what it was and not controlled for any political agenda, good, bad, or indifferent. Thank you, George Will. Similar opportunity, Cornell, for you now to wrap up this debate with a closing statement uh, summarizing your key points. I begin by invoking the metaphor used by Carter G. Woodson, the father and founder of African American History Month in this country and an extraordinary scholar uh, and historian. He used the example of the, the power of teaching people or conveying to a man, as he put it, uh, that you're an outcast in society. And the effect of this in terms of a willingness to go through the back door, to stand at the back door, and to insist that there be a back door in a democracy, in our republic. What I hear among activists and, and advocates uh, all across uh, this country, but also around the world, is an insistence that their stories be heard, that their voices be heard, that their histories be read and lifted up. And when those histories are lifted up, that also means that many of these statues have to come down so that those stories and histories might be heard, appreciated, listened to, and heeded. If we take note of the fact that in many instances, many of our social justice struggles uh, in 2021 are predicated with a deep appreciation of the past. When we hear uh, young people talking about uh, the tragedy of George Floyd's murder, but talking about it in the context of racial injustice in the criminal legal system, talking about the convict leasing system, talking about lynching, they are talking about history with a nuance and with a full appreciation of its power in the present. This is not a narcissistic exercise. This is not an exercise in self-preoccupation. This is an exercise in nation love, not self-love. It's an exercise in altruism, civic altruism, not narcissism. And because of that, I'm in fact hopeful that as these statues come down, more histories will be lifted up and our countries will be advanced in ways that advance the globe uh, and advance humanity. Thank you, Cornell. And thank you, George, for just uh, such a rich, civil, uh, substantive debate on you know, what has been a lightning rod uh, topic. I think we would all be better off as a society if we could have these types of conversations 
sharply different points of view, but listening to each other's arguments, engaging with reason, with history, uh, with civility. So on behalf of the Monk Debates community, George Cornell, thank you so much for participating in this Monk Debate. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much. Well, that wraps up today's debate. I want to thank our participants, George and Cornell, for a fantastic debate that gave me so much to think about. I hope you're also reflecting on the important issues and ideas that were raised in this debate. If you have feedback or reflections on what you've just heard, please send us an email. We'd love your response to this debate. That email to connect with us directly is podcast at monkdebates.com. That's M-U-N-K, debates with an S, dot com. Here's a recent listener email from Ken about our Monk Debate podcast with Janice Stein, which comes out every Friday for our Monk members. Ken writes, Dear Janice and Rudyard, I really enjoyed your debate on the Canadian federal election. Janice raised an interesting point about voting from a position of insecurity. I agree. We tend to vote against something rather than for it. Unfortunately, we behave like an insecure country on many levels, politically, socially, and certainly culturally. Hey, Ken, thanks for sharing those insights and for catching our regular Friday Monk Members Only podcast. This is free for all of our members to listen to anytime as part of our complimentary Monk membership. You can access your membership right now at S. Dot com Again, that's M-U-N-K, not M-O-N-K, debates with an S, dot com forward slash membership. Thank you for being part of our community, lending your time to our effort to restore the art of public debate in our time. I'm Rudyard Griffiths, your host and moderator. The Monk Debates are produced by Antica Productions and supported by the Monk Foundation. Rudyard Griffiths and Ricky Gerwitz are the producers. Abu Raheja is the associate producer. The Monk Debates podcast is mixed by Kieran Lynch. And the president of Antica Productions is Stuart Cox. Be sure to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like us, feel free to give us a five-star rating. Thank you again for listening. <laughs> <laughs>